Let us pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you for bringing us to the Bible study tonight. Thank you, Lord, because the study of your word makes us strong, giving us real spiritual backbone. And we pray, Lord, today as we study your word, you grant us the illumination and understanding of the Holy Ghost that illuminates and also light in the word in the heart of everyone tonight in Jesus name Amen. you have commanded us to study to show ourselves approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth and we pray the word of truth to be rightly divided and interpreted and applied in every heart every life tonight in Jesus name Amen. And also bring the application of the words to everyone. Lord, we pray that you move us in the right direction of living according to your will and bringing glory upon you here on earth in Jesus' name. Lead us deep into your word, deep into your truth, that will live to glorify, to please you. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Thank you very much, you can see. And we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're reading verses 1 and 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. For the more then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Verse 2. For ye know what commandments we give you by the Lord Jesus. As you look at the study we have tonight, we have the challenge of a church of a well pleasing walk before God. Look at that title well pleasing walk before God. Those two words before God, they're very, very important. There are many people, religious people in this world, that they do a lot of things, good things, wonderful things, even righteous things, spiritual things, but they do them before men. Yes, what you let a light so shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. But God first. We do it before God to please the Lord. Look at those two words. I'm looking at First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. In verse 13, to the end. That means to the purpose, for the purpose, in order that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. Give me the next two words before God. That's what he wants us to understand. That what we do and how we do it. And when we do it, the attitude we have, when we do it, we have the consciousness that God is watching us. And God is evaluating what we are doing. And he wants us to walk, to please him, so that as we live before him, before him, then our lives will be pleasing to the Lord. I want you to check out those two words in your Bible. You'll find many times the Lord saying, do this before me. Walk before me. Live before me. Act before me. Do everything you do in my sight, in my presence before me. Genesis chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 1. 
Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And Abraham, and Abraham was 90 years old and nine. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, before me, before me, and be thou perfect. The Lord is not interested in the people that do whatever they do only to please man only to please themselves. He wants you to please him. And he says, I'm calling you to a well-pleasing walk before me. Genesis chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 40 there. Genesis chapter 24, verse 40. And he said unto me, the Lord before whom I walk. The Lord before whom I walk. He says, I do everything I do in the presence of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord. I'm walking before him. He evaluates me. He examines me. He looks at what I do, whether it's for the purpose of myself, or only for others, or I really want to do it before him. And he said unto me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way and thou shalt take a wife for my own son of my kindred and of my father's house. In Psalm 56, I just want to show that the whole Bible emphasizes the fact that what you do, the life you live, you live that as unto the Lord. You do that before him. The challenge, the privilege, and the command and the exhortation that you have a well-pleasing walk before God. Psalm 56, we're looking at verse 13. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, and wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light in the land of the living. He says, I want to do this just before God. Do it in the sight of the Lord. What a challenge. The Lord is reminding us of your place of work, whether your boss is there or not, or manager is there or not, director is there or not. In your community, whether people are watching you or not, you know God is always watching. You're always in his presence. And therefore, everything you do and everything you think, and the things you plan, you do that before the Lord. Walk before God. Psalm 116, Psalm 116. I'm reading there from verse 9. 116, verse 9. It says, I will walk before the Lord. In the land of the living. He says, I'm making up my mind. I know people are around and they're watching me, but what they think or what they say really doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters to me is what God thinks about me. Therefore, I will walk before the Lord. I'll do this only in the sight of the Lord. The Bible, the New Testament, gives us an example of a couple that did everything they did in the sight of the Lord and they did this before God. What a challenge to you. What a challenge to me that what we do, we do it before God in the presence of the Lord. Luke chapter 1. I'm reading from verses 5 and 6. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Look at verse 6. And they were both righteous. Next to what's everybody? Before God. They were both righteous before God. And you know the problem with the Pharisees? They were righteous before their fellow Pharisees. You know the problem of the Sadducees? They were righteous before their fellow Sadducees. You know the problems of those people that ruled in the land of Judea, in the land of Israel, when Christ was here. They did everything in the sight of one another before men. But it says, these people are both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Verses 74 and 75, it now transfers that to you transfers that to me, that what we do, how we live, what we do that before him. And we do that before him every moment of the day, and every day of the week, and all the days of our lives. In Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75, that you would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness, Next two words, before him, how many, how many days? All the 
days of her life, when it's good, when it's bad, when it's sunshine, when it's raining, when you're on the mountaintop, when you're in the valley, when every blessing is flowing your way, and when it appears things are driving up, and when friends are near, when enemies are near, when you are in church, and when you are outside the church, all the days of your life, living and walking in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our lives. Come now to First Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm reading there from verses 12 and 13. You see the challenge the Lord has given us, the commandment, the exhortation. The Lord has given us and the expectation that he has of you and has of me. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men, even as we do toward you to the end he may establish your hearts on blameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his sins. Give me a good amen. amen. You notice three things at the end of chapter 3. At the end of chapter 3, we notice number 1, love. Look at verse 12. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. Love. That's number 1. And then we find another scene in verse 13 that is holiness in verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. We find a third thing, and that is the coming of the Lord. It says, even, the, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. You know, sometimes when you come to the Bible study and I start the Bible study. I sometimes will go over chapters 1, 2, 3 before I go to chapter 4. And then you think, what a waste of time. We learned that already. We've known that already. Come on now, go very quickly to chapter 4. But you know what uh, the apostle has done by the expression of the Holy Spirit? He spoke about three things at the end of chapter 3. Love holiness and the coming of the Lord and then it comes to chapter 4 now the whole of chapter 4 is talking about those three things number one love verses 1 all through to uh, the few verses there and then it talks about holiness and then it talks about it talks about the coming of the Lord first of all it talks about holiness from verse 1 all through to verse 8 and then verse 9 to verse 12 is talking about love and then from verse 13 all through to the end talking about the coming of the Lord. When therefore you come to the Bible study or maybe you come to a service on Sunday and then we've done something during the time of searching the scriptures together and then we pick that same passage of the scripture and now we expand it and then we, we give, make it deep and broad and high for everybody to understand better and you're wondering but we had that at the time of the scripture why are we having to go through that again at the time of preaching? You have the example over here. I'm not looking at it. Let's look at it from chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. Just the conclusion there to, for you to know. That section is talking about holiness. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who also has given us his Holy Spirit. That's one thing he spoke about in chapter 3, about holiness, and now he expands it, establishes it, emphasizes it all, all here in chapter 4. Now from verse 9, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed ye do it to all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that she increase more and more. That's about love. Now, about the coming of the Lord from verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we that who are alive and remain and unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, proceed, or hinder them which are asleep. And so you see what the apostle has done is not going over that same thing. By the way, why 
do we even have to do that? Why did the apostle do that? The reason is because you know, many times we hear something once and then we think we're blanched. It's in the head. It's not in the heart yet. We hear it once and we think, I know that. I've studied that. I can even quote it back to you. I can explain it to everybody. But it's not mixed with our practice, our lifestyle yet. That's why the repetition is for emphasis. And you know how God repeats, you know, some things in the Bible. He gave a dreams to Pharaoh. He gave him the first one. He repeats it again. And Joseph came to say, the repetition of that, doubling that to you is to show you that assuredly, this is going to happen. You read in the Psalms, and then you come to one Psalm, and then you come to another Psalm, and it's almost exactly the same as the former Psalm that you have read. And then you say, but they are the same. The repetition is for emphasis. If you didn't get what he's saying in Psalm 14, by the time you go to Psalm 52, saying the same thing all over again, then you say, now I get it. You're reading your Bible and Isaiah chapter 59 and then you come to Romans chapter 3 and it repeats almost the same thing in Romans chapter 3. Why the emphasis and why the repetition? Because you didn't get it that other time. It is the repetition that brings the emphasis and then you say, Lord, now I know what you are trying to tell me and now I'm going to do it. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. And as we come to this today, we're telling the Lord, oh Lord, whatever it is, I'm hearing it all over again as a reminder that you are telling me that this is the way to go. I'm going to accept your word. It will work in my heart, work in your heart in Jesus' name. Such righteousness that God is bringing up within us as we look at his love, look at his holiness, and look at the coming of the Lord is to make us live exemplary lives like saints of God so that we will not think that, well, I knew that before and then I don't need to know that again. He emphasizes it. He wants us to make progress in love and progress in holiness and progress in the service of the Lord. As I said already, and you can see it on your outline, we're talking about the challenge of a well-pleasing walk before God. I will walk to please God. I said I will walk to please God. You'll do it. We'll all do it together in Jesus' name. We're dividing, we're dividing the story to three parts. Number one, the pattern of walk that pleases God. If you want to know anything, you should want to know from the Bible, from the Spirit of the Lord, what's the kind of pattern of walk that pleases the Lord? A good child will say, I want to know what pleases daddy. A good daughter will say, I want to know what pleases my parents. The same thing a wife will want to know. I want to know what pleases my own husband is this good enough is this the way he wants it a good husband will say i want to know what pleases my wife and any good member of the church will know i want to know what pleases god and i want to know what pleases my father in the lord and that's why i want to know the pattern of work and the pattern of lifestyle that pleases god number two the practice of walking which displeases God. There are things that please God. There are things that displease the Lord. We want to know from the scriptures, from the teaching of the Spirit of God in the scriptures, the practice of walking which displeases the Lord. And then number three, the priority. The priority, the importance. The indispensability, the essence, something very essential, something you cannot do without, the priority of walking to please God. Let's come to number one, the pattern of walk that pleases God. I'm reading from chapter four of First Thessalonians, chapter four, First Thessalonians, verse one. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as she have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God so ye would abound more and more for ye know that ye know what commandments we gave by the Lord you're going to find something here that Paul the apostle said I'm not telling you this by myself this is not something, this is not just some. I want you to do this. I like you to do this. I appreciate it. If you do this, it says, no, this is by the Lord, by the word of the Lord, by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, would you notice five things here? Number one, number one here is the appointed, is the pointed appeal. The pointed appeal. It says, I beseech you. 
He says, I exhort you. He says, I'm pleading with you. And he says, I'm charging you. He says, I'm challenging you. It was a pointed appeal that furthermore, we will do what he has told us to do as brethren. Number two, he tells us a passionate admonition. A passionate admonition. It says, This one, I'm passionate about this. Because this is the very center of living to glorify the Lord and please the Lord. And therefore, it says, I'm exhorting you. And it is by the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot push this aside and just say, That's Paul. And just say that Silas, and just say that's Timothy. That's what they want. That if we do this, they will be happy. No. Making man happy, that is nothing. Making anybody happy, that's nothing. Making the church happy, that's good, but it's nothing. In comparison with making the almighty God happy about our lives. So it says, it's by the Lord Jesus Christ, a passionate admonition. And then number three is the past acceptance. He said, you know what? I have confidence telling you this. I'm happy teaching you. I'm happy exhorting you because you did it in the past. You're still going to do it today. You're going to do it in the future. The very fact that you're obedient in the past makes me to have confidence that you're going to obey in the future. That is why it says, even that as ye have received of us, you have received of us. And we see the impact of the word of God in your life. And because of that, we have the confidence to teach you. Which teacher will be excited in teaching if he has taught a class a number of times and you don't do a jot or a teacher of what he has said? But when you teach lesson one, and then those young people, they look it over, they do their own work, and they do their assignment, and they're, they're getting up very well. You're excited to teach lesson to you. I tell you, you taught lesson to you. And then those children, they just get on with it. They're excited about it, and they're discussing to one another, and they're living by it. You're excited to go on and go to number three. And so Paul, the apostle said, you know what? Thessalonians, I'm excited about you. The greatest thing I can do is just to stay with you and keep on teaching you because of your power past acceptance of the word. Number four is the proper attitude, the proper acts and the proper action. It says how ye ought to walk and to please God. It says these are the proper demonstration that you're a real child of God, that you're acting, you're having the attitude that you're going to be obedient to the word of God and then now it's telling them number five it says there's a positive advance. You're making progress. That you will do this more and more. And isn't that what you know about our church? Is so, we are so excited teaching you because you are obedient to the word of God. And I pray that obedience will increase more and more in Jesus name. Now we are going to look at the pattern. The pattern of work that pleases God. Verse 1. Let's look at that verse 1 again. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1. Furthermore then we beseech you brethren and exhort you. Look at that repetition again. We beseech you and exhort you. We challenge you and charge you. We command you and encourage you. We exhort you that by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. The Christian experience that converts us to become brethren is necessary before we can walk before God. You see, there are some people they are still in their natural self, in their natural state. They are still in their sinful state and they are trying to they are trying to do the will of God. They are trying to walk according to the word of God. But the word of God tells us it's impossible. The carnal man cannot please the Lord. The natural man receives not the things that belong unto God. The one who is not born again, dead in sins and trespasses. There's no way you'll be able to do the will of God and do what God wants you to do without the grace of God, without faith in Christ, without the conversion experience. That's why when you come in here, instead of just looking around and say, okay, the women, this is how they dress, and the men, this is how they walk gently, and this is how they talk, this is how they memorize the scripture, and just do that, it just be like a parrot. When a parrot says, good morning, good morning, and if you didn't know that it was a parrot talking, you're saying that it was a real human being, but the parrot saying, good morning, good morning, that parrot does not understand what good morning means. The parrot cannot say, you know, change anything. The following day again, good morning, good morning. And then every day of the good morning, good morning. And cannot spell that good morning because it's a parrot. There are some people like that. They're still parrots. 
no change, no conversion, no salvation, and he tried to copy, it will be external. It will be outward. You'll not be able to have the internal, inward transformation, salvation, and conversion except something has taken place. Look at Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. It's impossible for the natural man to be obedient to God. Let's look at Romans, Romans chapter 8. I'm reading there from verse 5. And then you will see that if we're going to walk according to the way that pleases the Lord, there must be salvation. There must be repentance. There must be conversion. It is that gracious work. The act of the grace of God washing away our sins and turning our lives around and changing, transforming us that makes us to actually live like a real child of God. And that's why sometimes you find, you know, somebody dresses like a Christian and talks like a Christian and then something happens. And then the fellow erupts like a volcano. And it's like an earthquake. There's a storm. Say so what? So and so dressing like this, erupting like that, like a volcano, and so and so getting angry like this. What happened? That fellow looks like you know a Christian on the outward, natural man, canal man, but does not have the real experience of being born again. It's the real experience of being born again that transfers it from the inside to the outside. That's the same way you really want to know that you're not a natural man, a natural woman. You're not a carnal one. You're not somebody who's just coming to church and having outward change without inner conversion, salvation experience. In Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be. He may try. He will not be able to do it. Neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh, tell me the rest, cannot, cannot. They may try but they cannot please the Lord. If you are going to please the Lord, an inner change in what change must take place. And the way that takes place is that you pray that all your sins were committed in the past, everything is totally forgiven and then he washes you and cleanses you whiter than snow. We're looking at Psalm 51. Psalm 51 I'm reading there from verse 1. Psalm 51 verse 1. This is how the change takes place. And this is how we come to please the Lord. The change that takes place is says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to the, thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. We're so happy for our newcomers that came here today and all the newcomers that come every time they come, we're excited when they come. But we want to reassure them that God is a God of love. He forgives sin. He blots us our transgression. And the very place we start is to kneel down before the Lord and then recollect all the bad things we have done, all the evil things we have done and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. But I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall I'll be saved. Oh Lord, I'm calling upon you. I'm a sinner. Turn my life. Change my life. Turn me around. I want to be a real child of God. I love these people. They're so quiet. They're so orderly. I want to live the life they're living, but I cannot do it in my own strength. Blot out my transgressions. That is how we get saved. And it is after that salvation it's after that experience of conversion, of being born again, we're able to live the life that pleases the Lord. Look at verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the outward external part. Where? Inward part, and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with Aesop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. I pray God will do it for everyone. 
whiter than snow. Whiter than snow when it washes and cleanses us. Then it says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out how many? Tell me out loud. All my iniquities. You know some people that they're, they're trying to turn over a new leaf and, and they're trying to adjust this and they say, well, I don't smoke too much anymore. I used to smoke 10 pieces of uh, sticks of cigarette. Now I've limited it to two. And you know, I used to fight every day. Now maybe once a day that I know fight, I now fight. I used to, you know, go to those prostitutes. And, but now, you know, I minimize that now because I've come to deeper life and I'm getting changed little by little. No. That's not how it takes place. You come to the Lord and say, all my iniquities, all my sins, all my evil, blot out all my iniquities, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Somebody who had been saved before, but he yielded to temptation and to pressures in the place of work, in the community, or yielded to a Jezebel somewhere, or yielded to the pressure of one Solomon or, or, or something somewhere, where now you are backsliding, you are coming back to the Lord, and you don't manage and patch up and say, Well, I still pretend, I still say, Praise the Lord, I still say, Hallelujah, I still sing Amazing Grace, I still walk gently, I still dress like they dress, so that maybe when I do that, God will eventually, time will cover my backsliding. Time never covers sin, it's the blood of Jesus that washes away sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's not time. It's the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so if somebody has backsliding, he's coming to the Lord to say, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. I'm not going to deceive myself, living in secret sin and in teaching. Living in secret sin and still guiding other people. Living in secret sin and still counseling. Living in secret sin and still evangelizing. He said, will you restore me? And you give back unto me the joy of your salvation. Only then, after the restoration, after the salvation, will I teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Look at verse 16. For thou deliverest, thou desirest not sacrifice. Else would I give it that delightest not in burnt offerings, in sacrifices of God. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shall thou be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness. That's what pleases God. The sacrifice of righteousness. The life of righteousness that is righteous before the Lord. I pray that we'll be conscious of this every time. And they will do and say and walk in a way that pleases the Lord every time in Jesus' name. We're looking at Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. How do we please God? What's the pattern of work and the pattern of lifestyle that pleases the Lord? We're looking at Micah chapter 6, and I'm reading from there from verse 6. Micah chapter 6, verse 6. It says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? You know, the Old Testament people, all the they, they did that every time. They would bring a goat, a sheep, or dove, or whatever, and then they sacrificed that on the altar. They didn't understand that that was just to atone for their sins of the past. But now, a new life, a converted life, a change of life, in a change. That's what God was looking for. And so they said, What am I going to do to please the Lord? Am I going to bring some ram, some burnt offering, or calf of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil, there are some people. Whenever they have done something wrong, they, they you know committed secret sin, and their consciences are whipping them and knocking them and slashing them, and then they're feeling guilty. Then they double their activity, church activity, religious activity. They do this, they do this. They run up and down. Hey, wait a minute. 
All those activities will not cover your sin. All those activities will not replace repentance and coming back to the Lord. So they said, what are we going to do? Are we going to multiply the sacrifices to bring to the Lord? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? There are some people that they begin to consecrate. They say, I will work full time. I will give all my time to the Lord feeling guilty you're guilty of what you've done and then you say what i'm going to i'm going to give all my time i'm, I'm going to go beyond paying tithe i'm going to give all my money to do this and to do that that does not solve the problem salvation is by grace go to the lord in prayer and confess and if you have to make restitution make right your way to the people you have offended go ahead and do that then the lord himself will give you a clear clean conscience he says shall i give my firstborn for my transgression or the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul he has showed thee O man what is good and what does the Lord require of thee? To do justly and to love mercy and to walk how? Humbly with thy God. That is what pleases the Lord. We're going to please the Lord in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. It says, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself an, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a well for a, for a sweet smelling savor. And that's what he's telling us that that's how to please the Lord. And then he says, But fornication or uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh what? Saints. Sometimes we listen to some preachers. They say they are sinners saved by grace. I thought if you are sinners, then there's a conversion, there's a turning around. And then there's a restoration. And some things are different now. You're no more what you used to be. As become a saints. Not as become a sinner, say by grace. He calls us saints after we're born again. Righteous people, believers, after we're born again. And he wants us to live that life. And he says, fornication, uncleanness, let it not be once named among you. You know, sometimes you'll find a local church. Last week, day, somebody stood up and said, I'm sorry, I offended the church. I've done something. Thing, I committed fornication. Terrible. Then another two weeks after, somebody rises up again. That's the local church. I'm sorry. I want to confess to the church that it was Satan. He deceived me. I committed fornication. What kind of church is that? And then two months after, somebody rises up in that same church. That's the local church. I am sorry. I want to confess to the workers. You people, please forgive me. I committed fornication. What's wrong with that church? That it should not be once named among you. And then they make it like a tradition. They make it like songs they sing every time. That, uh, you know, somebody, uh, every time the pastor says, uh, let's wait behind today, uh, somebody has uh, something to tell the church. Then we're saying, uh huh, somebody has done it again. No salvation, no change of life. If any man be in Christ, tell me the rest. It's a new creature. He says, all things become new. All things are passed away. I pray that that newness of life, salvation, real righteousness will be in everyone that names the name of Christ in this church in Jesus' name. That's a life that pleases the Lord. And I pray that God will help you that you have not such kind of life. A life that pleases the Lord. A life of righteousness. A life of holiness. A life of purity that you'll be able to say by the grace of God. It changed my life. It turned me around. And the things I used to do, I do them no more. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Reading from verse 10. That she might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Look at that. It says that we'll walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. God will do it for us. 
and he'll do it through you and through me in Jesus name this is what God wants that we will live like these Thessalonian believers and our life will be pleasing unto the Lord in Jesus name point number two now we're looking at the practice of walking which displeases God and there are things that displace the Lord and we need to understand we need to know that that you know those who are pleasing the Lord they are very careful they are very observant they are very thoughtful and they are faithful unto the Lord they say this is the teaching of the word of the Lord whether pastor is there or not whether our leaders are there or not our coordinators group coordinators overseers whether they are there or not our sectional leaders who love us so much and they want us to get to heaven whether they are there or not we know that our commitment is unto the Lord and because that commitment is unto the Lord we do the things that please him but I need to tell you there are things that displease the Lord and when you know that if you really love God you're going to avoid the things that displease such a person even on human level you know if you love a particular person and you know that person loves you and thinks highly of you and respects you very much you don't want to do anything that will offend that person that will displease that person if we do that from man to woman from wife to husband from parents to children and from children to parents and then from teacher to teacher or maybe uh, students to headmaster or whatever how much more about God our Redeemer how much more about Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior that is done so much for us is giving so much for us is sacrificed so much for us that we don't want to do anything that displeases the Lord and then let's come to First Corinthians chapter 10 and see the things that displease the Lord those children of Israel you think about them you say how ungrateful they were how unfaithful they were how disloyal they were the Lord rescued them from the bondage of Egypt and then the Lord opened the Red Sea and they passed over and the Lord rained manna from heaven he gave them angels food to eat and the Lord healed their sicknesses and he delivered them from all their oppressions and the Lord sent his word healed them all there was no, no one feeble or sick among them and the Lord defeated their Amalekites and all their enemies and see how they repaid God ungrateful people unfaithful children we will not be like that give me a good amen, amen. Look at what they did. They displeased the Lord. We're looking at the first Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter 10. We look at it from verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. With many of them, many of those that ate at God's manner, many of those that drank God's water out of the rock, many of the people that were delivered out of the land of Egypt, with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. And even at it, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Neither let us do what? Tell me out loud. Neither let us commit fornication. Let me ask you. If let's say your father was sitting in the sitting room and then you were there as a young man and then a lady came in and beckoning to you, making face to you and saying let's commit fornication. And then you say where? I say, well right here. If your father is right there looking at you, will you do that? Tell me out loud. No. Let's say even your friend who, who loves righteousness, born again, real child of God, is sitting right there with you. And then a Jezebel comes to you and is, you know, trying to lure you into evil. While that friend is there that you really love and loves you, do you think you'll be able to do that in the presence of that friend? No. Now, but God is there and is watching you. He says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's right there. You're living before him because he knows everything everywhere. And then somebody comes to tempt you and he says, let's do this. If you do that kind of thing, that means that you don't respect God as much as you respect even your earthly father. You don't respect God as much as you respect a human friend. If you could do that in the presence of the Lord, because he sees everything that you do. Nothing is hidden before him. Look at these ungrateful, disloyal people that uh, they yielded to temptation and they yielded to fornication right there in the presence of the Lord. The pillar of fire was there every time. 
And the pillar of cloud was there every time. And the presence of God was with them every time. Right under the nose of God, in the very presence of God, they committed that fornication. That's why the Lord said, if you can do this in my presence, what are you doing? That's why I destroy them. I pray you will not be destroyed. That's why it says in verse 8, neither let us commit fornication. A psalm of them com committed and fell in one day. How many of them fell in one day? Three and twenty thousand. Think about that. When you think about twenty three thousand, large number of people that died because they committed such a sin. And today, this is the New Testament. You know, some people they say, Old Testament, thou shalt not, Old Testament, thou shalt not. This is New Testament. In the New Testament, it's not encouraging us to steal because we're New Testament people commit adultery because we're New Testament people, commit fornication because we're New Testament people, and then be violent and wicked because we're New Testament people. Even in the New Testament, the New Testament is higher, it's deeper, it's richer, and it's better than the old covenant. The righteousness of the New Testament, the holiness of the New Testament is much, much higher than that of the old covenant. Then it says in verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, that, and they were destroyed of the, of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them, for examples, and they are reaching for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that standeth, tell me the rest, Tell me out loud. Let him that standeth take it lest he fall. Oh, some people say, you know, it's because the temptation was too great. I couldn't trust it. The thing just came upon me like a flood, a mighty flood, and swallowed me up. The thing just came like a mighty torrent. It was too much for me. How will God expect you to be able to overcome that? Look at verse 13. There is no temptation taking you. But such as is common unto man. And, but God is faithful. Who will not permit you, suffer you, allow you to be tempted? Above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape. That ye may be able to bear it. We will overcome. I said we will overcome. The things, the practice of walking that displeases God. We're looking at Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Numbers chapter 11, and we're looking at here from verse 1. Numbers 11. We're looking at here from verse 1. The things that displease the Lord. It says, and when the people complain, it displeases the Lord. Their people, their habit is, they just complain every time. They grumble every time. They grumble about the church. The church did not owe you anything. And they, you need to save your money inside the church. Save your money in the bank. You know, anytime they are not able to pay out rent, they complain against the church. They are not able to pay school fees for children. They complain against the church. Or maybe something is happening to them and nobody is visiting them. They complain against the church. You go to the pastors, you go to the leaders. Don't just wait in your house and say they didn't come. You go to them, complaining, complaining, complaining. And then if something does not go well, they complain against God, against leadership, against everybody. And if they've done something foolish and they are reaping the punishment of their sin, they complain against, you know, whoever is responsible for putting them right. Don't complain. Complaining displeases the Lord. The people who go about in the church murmuring against this and murmuring against that, it displeases God. Look at that in verse 1 again. It says, and when the people complained, it displeased it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. I pray that it will not happen to you. I thought you'd say good, good amen there. In Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter chapter eleven, Second Samuel chapter eleven. I'm reading verse twenty-seven. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her unto his house. And she became his wife and bear him a son. But the thing that David had done, what? 
displeased the Lord. You know, there are some people that think they have all authority. Nobody can challenge them. That's how David felt at that time. He was the king of Israel. Uriah had gone to the battlefield. And then he was uh, carelessly walking about in the pavement veranda of his house. And he saw the woman while she was bathing herself. The reason God gave us eyelids is to be able to close the, close the eyes. Whatever you see, an object of temptation. And you see why God gave us the lips. It's so I can close our mouth when something foolish is trying to come out of your heart. Have you noticed that you know the ears doesn't have any, don't have any closing? The ears are just there. They are open. Anything anybody is saying, the sun comes into your ear. But the mouth has lips. You can close the mouth. And the eyes have eyelids. You can close the eyes. And you know, David, he, he saw the object of temptation and he kept on looking, kept on looking until temptation overcame him. He then sent for the woman. You know the story, what, she, what he did. And the woman said, King, I am pregnant. And so he sent for the husband from the battlefield. He, let, he told that man to leave, fighting the enemies of God, fighting the battle of the Lord. And then the man will not even go. The man was consecrated and committed. I said, Why don't you go home? Why don't you go and enjoy yourself at home and be with your wife? Oh, the man said, The ark of the Lord is on the field. How can I go to my family? Ah, is that right? And then he made him drunk. Even in the drunken state, the man said, although you make me drunk, I'm committed and consecrated. I'll not go home. And eventually, then he wrote a letter to Job. He said, Job, this man killed this man and put him in the hottest part of the battlefield. And then he went to Job and sent message that Raya is dead. He said, that's all right. That's all right. I don't care that you lose the battle. You see how the lust of the flesh can drive a man that he wasn't interested anymore in the victory of the Lord. And then after Urias died, then he took the wife. After all, it's king. It's above law. It's above Bible. It's above judge. Above discipline. Nobody can touch me. And then it says, and the sin that the king David did displeased the Lord. If you are acting like that, living like that, thinking that nobody can touch you, untouchable, nobody can discipline you, that's a God in heaven. I said, they say, God in heaven. If man cannot catch you, Almighty God will catch you. And if you die in that condition, terrible. That's hell fire. I pray you repent. We're looking at Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 1. The practice of walking which displeases the Lord. Zechariah chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 2. The Lord has been, has been so displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn you unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. And then it says, Be ye not as your fathers. You know, there are some people, they say, we're following the example of our forefathers. We're following the example of our leaders. Well, follow Christ. If your leader is doing something that is not according to the will of God, follow Christ. If you're, you know, my father, we were in this religion, we were born in this church, in this religion, and sees that the work of my father, what if the religion your father followed displeased the Lord? You just follow that religion. Sometimes we are witnessing, we are saying, come to the Lord. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, be born again. Oh, he says, you know what? My father was in such and such a church. And that's where I was born. I'm going to die there. Don't die in sin. Don't die in evil. If your father did something displeasing unto the Lord, then you come to the Lord and say, my father did that in his ignorance. I will not do that. You know, sometimes there's somebody that brought you to know the Lord as your personal savior. You call him my father in the Lord, my mother in the Lord. That's the soul winner. He brought me to know the Lord. And now this, your father in the Lord or your mother in the Lord is not backsliding. He's doing things that are not according to the will of God. And just say, well, I love him. I respect him. Although it's not as he used to be, I'm still going to follow him. You want to perish? You're following a backslider. He says, your father displeased me. And I don't want you to follow the deeds of your father. I pray that God will give us a change of heart. And it will give us real heart to follow after the Lord in Jesus' name. 
Do you remember that Judas Iscariot went out and he preached with all the other all the other eleven, and they all came back, and God had given them some real victory. Now, eventually, Judas Iscariot loved money more than the Lord Jesus Christ. What if the people that repented because Judas preached unto them, they say, I'm going to follow what Judas did because he was the one that led me to the Lord. As Judas perished, such a person will perish. Don't you remember that Demas was also a preacher before with Paul the Apostle? And then he preached to other people, don't love the world, none of the things of the world. Eventually, Demas, he went back to the things of the world, loving the present world and forsaking the Apostle. What if the converts of Demas will say, well, hey, that's the person that brought me to the Lord and I'm still going to follow his example. He has displeased the Lord. You don't want to follow that. Remember Barnabas and Saul? Separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I have committed them to, I have appointed unto them. Eventually, Barnabas now also displeased the Lord and left the work. Are you going to follow Barnabas because he was the one that led me to the Lord? The Lord is giving us a challenge. Look at the lives of people. And if they are doing things that are displeasing unto the Lord, you are not just you sheepishly follow people into hell. You will not follow people into hell. You keep on taking your stand, knowing that this is the will of the Lord. Look at verse 4 again, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 4. Be not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, neither hearken unto me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever here on earth? That it says in verse 6, but my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts taught to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doing so as he dealt with us. I pray that this will not overtake us in Jesus' name. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, And I am very so displeased with the heathen that are at ease. The people who are not born again, unsafe people, lost people, sinful people, they are at ease. As if, well, there's, there's nothing to worry about. Yes, we are sinners, we are heathens, we are pagans. There's nothing to worry about. After all, we're still having rain and sunshine and every season, nothing to worry about. After all, we're still getting married and having children, nothing to worry about. Backsliders who are at ease. Sinners who are at ease unbelievers who are his and they are not very conscious of the judgment coming upon them God says I am against them I'm so displeased with them I pray that none of us will be at ease in sin in Jesus name Have you notice you know some people whose consciences are hardened they've done something wrong and now we know about it and, uh, you know, sometimes they're even disciplined and they just walk leisurely and go about and, uh, you know, enter here, enter here, enter there. And they don't feel anything. I'll say, I had that something happened. Say, yes, well, what's, what's the matter? That happened. And, yeah, I mean, I'm the only person that that has happened to before. And they just take life at ease, even with the sin, with the backsliding. And the Lord is saying, I'm displeased. Well, sinners, well, backsliders, the pagan, the heathen, who are at ease. I pray that the word of God will wake us up. And then we come to the Lord. Repent of our sins and turn to the Lord fully in the name of Jesus. I'm, I'm waiting for an amen there. Amen. The Testament believers already knew the important, indispensable fundamentals of, the, of Christian living. They knew what was required and demanded by God to walk and to please him in everything. Not only in some things, in everything. There are things that please God and there are things that are displeasing unto God. Confessing and forsaking all sins, repenting of our sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as our only Savior. That is what pleases the Lord. But covering up our sins with religious activities and professing salvation without conversion, that displeases God. But trusting God and seeking him for grace to live in newness of life, that pleases God. On the other hand, relying on self-righteousness and pretending that outward righteousness without inward transformation is sufficient, that displeases God. Walking in humility, in honesty, in holiness, pleases the Almighty God. But on the other hand, walking in pride, 
walking in dishonesty and walking in hypocrisy displeases him walking godliness with contentment great gain that pleases god greed and covetousness that will displease him consecration to god's will pleases god but commitment to self-will displeases him pursuing the evangelization of the world evangelization of the laws at all cost that pleases god neglecting to save the laws because of selfish consideration that displeases him being diligent and walking in the steps of Christ pleases God, but careless living and careless walking as the men of the world that displeases God. That's why the Lord is saying we should walk to please Him. Let us walk to please the Lord. We're going to walk to please the Lord in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three the priority of walking to please God. I want you to underline that word on point number three priority. The priority. That means this is number one. This means this is essential. This means this is the indispensable thing. The priority of walking to please God. I need to explain this to you because there are many people that they don't understand that things are graded and things have different levels and that there is a high level there's this number one that this number one thing is so indispensable it's a priority let me explain to you what i mean salvation and service service is very important but salvation is more important and before you get into service you make sure that you have the priority of salvation number two hearing the word of god and praying Prayer is very important. You find some churches that they pray, 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 pray every time. Pray in the night, night vigil, morning, every time they're praying. Prayer is good. But hearing the word of God is a priority. That's more important. There are some people, they don't go to Bible study, they don't attend Bible study. If you say prayer meeting, they are there. Night vigil, they are there. They pray and pray and pray. But you know, hearing the word of God is more important. Other people, the offering. You know, they're going to give offering when they meet you on the way. They say, you are a man of God. You are a minister of God. You must receive a blessing from me. And they want to give offering. Anytime they go to church, I will not go to church empty. And offering is good. But obedience to the word of God is a priority. It's greater than offering. You know, there are some people that fasting, that is for them the essential thing anything happening to them fasting 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 but if we're just fasting and we do not understand righteousness righteousness is more important than fasting there's some people you know sometimes uh, especially because I, I travel about quite a lot i go to this church i go to that assembly and those assemblies i'm telling you they sing and they beat all their things and all their guitar and all their trumpets and they, they say praise worship that is the number one thing listen to me praise worship is good but then the word of god tells us justice and fairness that's priority uh, whatever we sing whatever praise worship we have and there's some people that will spend one hour doing praise worship and then when it comes to you know having justice and fairness and equity and holiness righteousness they don't know about that but the priority is the life we live the thing that the Lord has given us, other people, is the outward conformity. That, that, you know, that one catches us in deeper life. Outward, outward kind of conformity. You know, the way we dress and the way we walk and the way we talk. And, you know, the way we... That's deeper life. That's deeper life. But there's anger inside. There's animosity inside. There's wickedness inside. There's ill-treating the wife at home inside. And there's ill-treating the husband and talking some naughty things inside their hearts. But as for, as for putting on their scarf, of course. Sometimes even when they're going to sleep, they put the scarf there. Who knows that they might be praying in their dreams. So the scarf has to be there every time. All that out of committee that takes precedence over holiness and righteousness, that's nothing. The priority is the kind of life we live in word purity. Do you know there are people that are buried in church activity? Church activity, church activity. Here we are, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. And we're always there. Evangelism zero. 
But the priority is evangelism. Occupy till I come. When he said occupy till I come, he was talking about evangelism. He's not talking about all these other good, good activities that we do. All those good activities are not as important as saving the laws. Uh, even, you know, there are people that are uh, just say uh, all they want is miracle, miracle. And uh, we believe in miracles. But, you know, miracles are not the priority. What's the priority? Doing the will of God. There are people that neglect the will of God, which is the priority thing to do, doing the will of God from the heart. But then only miracle, 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 miracle. And they put it upside down. Other people is manifestation of spiritual gift, prophecy and revelation, having the word of knowledge and word of wisdom. They will fast, they will pray, they will read, they will study, they will search, but there's no love. But love is the priority above all those spiritual gifts. Other people is just duty. Duty. No pure mind, pure attitude, only duty. I'm to do my duty. This is where I am. But we need to understand priority. And when we get to heaven eventually, when we get before the Lord, it's going to say, that was the project. You neglected the most important thing. And then you are just on good, good things, good, good things, but you neglected better things that were higher. Let me show you from the word of God. I'm reading from Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 8. Open your Bible very quickly. Proverbs chapter 15. We're looking at verse 8. 15 verse 8. It says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. It's telling us there that uprightness, righteousness, it's telling us that salvation is more important than sacrifice and giving and service. Look at Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs 28, I'm reading from verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. The people that they do not have anything to do with Bible study. Studying the Bible, coming to Bible study on Monday or Tuesday, whichever day you come to Bible study in your church, in your local church, they don't go to Bible study, only prayer. But the priority is hearing the word of God. How about the people that come? They're physically present at the Bible study, but their heart is not there. Their mind is not there. After the service, they want to distribute a business card. You know, I just established and registered a business, and this is the card. I just established a school, and this is my card. I just got this. You know, I'm establishing something, sowing something. If you want to sow for your company, you want to sow for your student, I am here. Only business card. Although they come to the Bible study, their heart is not there. Their mind is not there. If you ask them, what did they say? What did they teach? They are forgotten because in their mind, only prayer. And some people, through the Bible study, they're sleeping and sleeping. If anybody touch, brother, you are sleeping, leave me alone. And then after the Bible, they slept through the Bible study. The time of prayer, they begin to shake their head and shake everywhere. They say they are praying. God says that's abomination. The priority is hearing the word of the Lord. Look at verse 9 again. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the Lord, even his prayer shall be abomination. I'm looking at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Obedience is the priority above offering. Offering, offering, offering. We got that together to offer to our God. Offering is good. But when you leave obedience to the word of God, you have left the most important thing, the priority. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 21. But the people took of the spoil of the sheep, sheep and oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken, to listen, to pay attention than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and, in, and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected thee from being king. You see that he came with an offering. You know there are people that steal money from their companies. Then they come to give tithes of what they are stolen. What God said, destroy. Some people would occultism. 
idolatrous practices. They get money out of that. They say they are going to give offering. God said, destroy idol. Destroy the occultic things. You don't sell occultic things. Other people, it's alcohol and cigarette. The Lord said, destroy the alcohol. Destroy the cigarette. They sell it and they say, I'm coming to bring the offering before the Lord. You are disobeying the Lord. All your money, what's nothing? And this is what I said, telling us that obedience is a priority, not your offering. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. I'm reading there to you from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Yet they seek me daily. They are religious. They come to church. They go to synagogue. They go everywhere. They seek me daily. And then it says, and they like to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances, the ordinance of their God. And they ask of me the ordinances of justice and they take delight in approaching to God. Look at verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted? Say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exert all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife, and debate, and smite with the feast of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under, his, under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day unto the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy bodies and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that thou cover him that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh you know what the Lord is saying say righteousness practical righteousness profitable righteousness compassionate righteousness is more important than all that fasting but people don't understand the priority look at Amos chapter 5 Amos chapter 5 I'm reading to you from verse 21 to verse 24 Amos chapter 5 Amos chapter 5 verse 21 it says in Amos chapter 5 verse 21 here is telling us I hate, I despise your feast days and I, I will not smell in your solemn assemblies you know there are some people they say they have love feast, love feast they might want to kill goat or kill sheep or kill ram and they say we just want to you know after the service we have had a normal service and now we are going to merriment or there's a kitchen behind, uh, you know, the church building there. Then they cook and cook and cook. And from after the service for hours, they're still eating. And they say it is love feast. Righteousness is not there. Holiness is not there. Lust will come in. Covetousness will come in. Greed will come in. And they eat until there's gluttony. And the Lord, they say, what are you doing? You say you are following the Bible, love feast. Where did you see that? That you're bringing drunkenness. They don't understand priority. In Christian service, in serving the Lord. Look at verse 22. It says, Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat bees. Take thou away from me the noise of, your, of thy songs. The songs became noise in the ears of the Lord. When there's no righteousness, when there's no holiness, when there's no sanctification, the priority is righteousness. The priority is holiness. It says all the rest is noise. All the singing is noise. All the playing of instruments is noise. If there's no salvation, if there's no sanctification, if there's no obedience to the word of God, the rest is noise. All the praise worship, all the guitar and all the drumming, the dancing and everything, all that is noise in the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. It says in verse 23, Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of the views of your violins. 
but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream is telling us that justice, fairness, righteousness, holiness, sanctification, that is the priority. I'm looking now at uh, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, that inward purity and inward holiness is the priority above all the outward things. I've been saying this over and over now for how many, how many years and how many months and how many weeks. I've been emphasizing this. This year, I've said it over and over that inward purity, inward lifestyle is more important than all these outward things. I'm not telling you to be worldly. I'm just saying that bring forth things first so that we'll get to heaven. When his cup does not get you to heaven, if you're angry, if you're wicked, if you are deceitful, if you are faithful, unfaithful to your husband, unfaithful to the word of God, and you only look like Christian outwardly, all those outward things, they are not the priority. It's the inward life of the Christian, the priority of walking to please the Lord. Let's look at Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 25. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Then it says in verse 26, that blind Pharisees cleanse first, first, first. That's the priority. Cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, and the outward of them may be clean also. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also appear outwardly appear righteous unto men but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity the Lord is telling us that what he wants number one is the inward purity inward holiness blessed are the pure in heart for they shall do what if you know it tell me out loud they are the people that will see the Lord we're looking at Matthew chapter 7 miracle miracle oh, miracle is good Healing the sick is good. Casting out devils is good. Raising the dead, that's good. There's something more important. That's a priority. It's a priority. It tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. It says, Not every not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. It tells us right there. It says, Miracles. That's good. But not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name I will cast out devils. And in thy name I have done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Do you know there are places where they emphasize healing, deliverance, Casting out devils, having prosperity, overcoming territorial spirit, raising the dead, having this and that. And they never emphasize salvation. They never emphasize holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And there are some people, maybe you come in here and because we teach line upon line, precept upon precept, you run to those places. I want to see miracle. I want to see miracle. What shall it profit a man? If he sees all the miracles in the world and he loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Lord is telling us that the real thing, the real important thing is this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I pray that the Lord will give us understanding hearts. And we will do what the Lord has told us to do in Jesus' name. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading verse 17 here. I'm going to read it from verse 14 for you to have a clear picture of what the Spirit of the Lord is telling us through Paul the Apostle. I've been emphasizing for a long time now that the Lord wants us to evangelize and that all these church activities, church maintenance ministry, that's not the most important. He wants us to evangelize and he wants us to preach the gospel. He says that is a priority. I want you to think about your local church. Maybe your local church, you're 200. You have two million outside that local church. 
Maybe your local church or 2,000 in that local church. You have about 5 million outside that local church. And the people outside the church who need the gospel, they are more important than all the church maintenance ministries that we're doing. That saving the lost, preaching the gospel to the people who are lost is very, very important. It's a priority. And, you know, we've heard it over and over. And you're here in the church. What do you do? I'm there. I'm, I'm, you know, doing this work. I'm doing this work in the church. How about the work outside? How about the preaching the gospel? Look at First Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. I, and I baptized also the house of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Look at verse 17. For God sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. You see that? Jesus spoke about water baptism. Jesus commanded to, what, to do water baptism. He said, he that believeth and is, and is baptized shall be saved. Water baptism is in the word of God. It's part of church activity that when people get converted, we baptize them in water. But Paul the apostle said, the priority is not just baptizing people in water, just staying there every Saturday instead of going out to do evangelism and baptizing people, baptizing people. He said, the priority is preaching the gospel. And you know, there are people that, you know, some of our leaders, pastors, overseers, coordinators, group coordinators, is marriage committee that takes evangelism away from us. Marriage is good. Marriage committee is good. But when marriage committee replaces evangelism, that's bad. That's bad. Other church activities were practicing and practicing and practicing. And then that takes away evangelism. That's terrible. That's what the Lord is saying. He wants us to come into the priority of pleasing the Lord. That means that all those activities that are taking evangelism, we readjust them. And if somebody, another person can do the water baptism, here we are, thousands of us. And then, you know, everybody is going to leave us out because we're baptizing 10 people. One person, two people can go and do that. And the rest of us, we're going to do evangelism. The Lord is bringing us to the priority of what is at the heart of God. And I pray that God will give us an obedient heart in Jesus' name. Look at your life, examine your life, and find out what am I doing? What's my emphasis in that? What's the priority of my life? What is it that really we're concentrating on? I, you know, sometimes there are people that will even say, hey, where is our pastor? Where is our GS? Our GS has gone now for two weeks, for two months, for one year. We cannot see him. Oh, yes, you've learned enough. You're still hearing Bible study. You're still having Sunday worship. And there are people outside that are not had once. And we need to tell them. And the Lord is saying that we need to readjust our priority. GS and overseer, state overseer, region overseer, national overseer, all the pastors, coordinators, plant churches, evangelize and go everywhere and saturate every city with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to do it. I said we're going to do it. You know, I said sometimes ago, I said that, you know, every section of the church should give a tithe of what you have on, on, you, on, the, on the personnel to plant churches that if you're in that section, you are 400, give us 40 people out of there. Let's plant churches and make them pastors. And if you're 200, then give us 20. A tithe of that. The 180 remaining will continue that section of work. And let us bring back the priority of really preaching the gospel so that before the end comes, everybody will hear. If you will do it and I will do it and we all do it together, nobody will have an excuse that they are in our nation, in our country, and they never had the preaching of the gospel. I'm looking at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, and I'm reading from verse 10. It says, and this and the gospel must first be published among all nations. The way we are now, and we concentrate on minor things, concentrate on church activity, and we're not reaching out to the lost. How will they hear? The Lord is challenging us. What pleases Him is evangelism and reach out to the people that are lost. Bring first thing for seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All the other things shall be added in Jesus' name. Shall we do it? I said, we're we going to do it. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord will help us. Walking to please the Lord. Walking to please the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Coming to lay everything upon the altar. Saying, oh Lord, here we are. We're going to do things pleasing unto you. Let us rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. 
is spoken to us about love, about holiness, about the coming of the Lord. Let's come to the Lord and say, Lord, I come to you again. Examine your heart. Examine your life. Whether you be in the faith or know you not, whether you are reprobates, come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'll not be a reprobate. I'll give myself, I'll give my heart to the word of God, my life to the word of God. I'm going to obey the word of God, the challenge of a well-pleasing walk before the almighty God. It's calling us to love. Many sinners around us. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If we love the sinners, we'll preach to them. We'll sacrifice time, sacrifice resources, even sacrifice position in the church. We'll not be concentrating on, they call me this, they call me that. Position, you sacrifice them. You sacrifice what you love. So as to minister in love to the people who are perishing. And the word of God has reminded us on holiness again. More than ever before. Deeper than ever before. Higher than ever before. That you examine your heart and say, Lord, I've not done enough. In what holiness? In what purity? In what sanctification? So that our religion will not just be the outward expression I wear the old time type of trusses that's all our religion I wear the old time kind of pair of shoes slippers, that's our religion the old time kind of gown, skirt that's our religion go from the outward go inward pure in heart holy in heart holy in attitude in what sanctification in what purity in what lifestyle of following after Christ and believing in the coming of the Lord and waiting that we'll be ready prepared when he shall come Remember the Lord has given us a pattern of walking in a way that will please the Lord. And you cannot walk to please the Lord without salvation. Without salvation. If you are backsliding, you are shedding crocodile tears before your pastor, before your general superintendent, shedding crocodile tears before a region overseer, state overseer, national overseer, before a group coordinator, before a coordinator, that will not, that will not do you when your heart is broken before the Lord. When you lie that down helpless before the Lord, saying, Lord, I have sinned. Lord, I have sinned. I've done this evil before you. I'm no more worthy to be called your child. I'm so dirty. Not worthy to be called a member of a Bible believing church. But Lord, I come asking for your mercy, asking for your love. When that heart is broken and you come to the Lord sincerely, and all the carnality is crushed and crucified. That's what the Lord is looking for a contrite heart a bleeding heart a humble heart oh lord you will not despise that's what pleases the lord and then the blood of jesus will wash you and wash you whiter than snow remember there are things that displease the lord don't worship the position of anybody david was a king what he did displeased the Lord. Balaam was a prophet. What he did displeased the Lord. Solomon was a wise man. What he did displeased the Lord. Barnabas he was a man of consolation. What he did displeased the Lord. Demas was a companion of Paul the Apostle. What he did displeased the Lord. 
You don't just follow somebody because of the name they had in the past, authority they had in the past, the kind of life they, have been, they had in the past. Look away from all men, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him. Despise the cross, despise the shame, embrace the cross, following after, pleasing the Father. You follow Christ. Walking in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Living a life that pleases the Lord. Make first things first. Important things, indispensable things. Priority. Salvation above service. Hearing the word of the Lord, studying the word of God about prayer. Prayer meeting, prayer meeting, prayer meeting, night vigil. Prayer is good. If you make studying the word as number one, offering, selling cigarette and giving cigarette money as offering, selling alcohol, destroying lives. Carrying cocaine and bringing cocaine money as offering. That's like witchcraft in the sight of the Lord. Obedience to the word of God is a priority. Fasting. Fasting, fasting, fasting. The Lord is saying righteousness, godliness. Holiness. That's a watch, word, and lifestyle. Praise, worship, singing, choir, orchestra, music, concert. Without righteousness, without holiness, without sanctification. Or fight, push other people down, so we can have chance to sing. God says that's abomination before Him, and He counts all the singing as noise. The priority of our life is not praise worship, it's not singing, it's righteousness. The Bible doesn't say without singing, no man shall say the Lord. Without orchestra, no man shall see the Lord. Without all the guitar and the tambourine, no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Miracle. Performing miracle. I have power, I have authority. You can keep on walking miracle until you walk into hell. If you are not holy, if you are not saved, if you are not free from private sin, besetting sin, hidden sin, walking miracle doesn't take you to heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out devils in your name, done many wonderful works in your name? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk in iniquity. Church duty, church activity. The little church will belong to the local church will belong to all that we're doing in that local church takes all our time organization administration water baptism marriage committee this this and that church discipline church organization all that takes our time 
And the great commission is abandoned. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the priority. Commit your life, commit your time, commit your resources to evangelism and church planting. So there will be a vibrant, living, Bible-believing church near everyone in your city. Every village in your local government. Go preach the gospel. Occupy until I come.